to come in. There it is. There it is. Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday and welcome to the sisters interview. I am a Shaxi and this is my sister Sarifkin. And uh, we are interviewing uh, our local <laughs> landed parents and baronesses this month. And uh, so we are welcoming uh, the Baron and Baroness of Madrona, um, Enzio and Spike. And I always say it wrong. Rifkin and I have a running uh, argument about it and I'm wrong, so I'm admitting it. <laughs> if it makes wrong. you feel better, I often refuse to call her Spike and call her speaking myself. So, 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 so I might be part of the problem. <laughs> I, I warmly welcome anything that's close and I don't hear very well. So if I ignored you, it's not that you said it wrong. It's that I didn't hear you. Good to know. <laughs> so um, you are Baron and Baroness of sort of one of the founding uh, baronies in our kingdom. It's also yeah, the second, the second oldest barony in the known world. Wow, that's well, kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, how did that, uh, oh, I guess we should back up and uh, how did you two find the SCA? So I found the SCA by seeing a June fair when it was in a park during Viking Fest in Paulsbo when I was in my teens. So that would have been maybe the late 80s. It was the first time I saw them. And uh, my senior year in high school saw SCA sign at the end of the street and went down and said, what are you doing here? And they were doing a feast and I, uh, they were sold out, but I went and served and I bought myself a membership and I got all the publications and then there was no SCA present in my university. And so there was a long time before I got to come back to the SCA. And after I moved back to Seattle from after college, uh, met people at parties <laughs> who were in the SCA and finally got connected to that and happily dragged NZO after me. So I have a not quite finding the SCA story where I was going to college. I was looking for I was looking through the college clubs and I was actually looking for 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 a, a tabletop gaming group. And, and I saw a sign for the SCA and, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of neat. It, I, I went went to a first room. I'm like, oh, this is what, not what I want. And then and, and then four years later, I followed my girlfriend I met in college out here and joined the SCA. Nice. And it turns out maybe it was what you wanted. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> you probably would have found some tabletop role players there too. Okay. <laughs> that seems to be a common theme. <laughs> so uh, where did you start out? Where were you uh, located when you started? Um, my so I bought my first membership in Dragon's Lair, and um, but basically we've played in Madrona since day one. Oh, it, wow. it, it's, it, it's a it's a it's a funny anecdote because uh, we were having a meeting with uh, some fine gentleman from Portolo, and 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 he may have made the statement that yeah, that's the funny thing about Madrona. Nobody actually starts there, and 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 both Spike and I look sheepishly like we started here. <laughs> me. Yeah. Yeah. Who was more of us? <laughs> Who was Baron and Baroness when you started? Um, uh, Jalen and Traherne were the first Baron and Baroness I saw. The first Madrona uh, thing I attended was a um, demo at uh, Greenspire. Awesome. awesome. Uh, it sounds like we probably started about the same time then. Yeah. I think maybe, and because uh, MZO moved out that year, um, that it might have been... Was it already? No, no, it, it was uh, because we went to a, a Sondheim fe feast, which the, they they all court, and then my second event was the twelfth night in Ken's uh, Kelso, Kelso, Kel Kelso, where they stepped down. So, so I had two events with Jane Lynch and Harry. I was Seneschal during that time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Yeah, that's not a job you should take on in your first year in the SCA. <laughs> Barony or the kingdom? The Barony. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah, so that was fun. God, no! <laughs> anyway, um, did you, uh, were you people that that held office right away or? Oh, um... uh, yeah. Yeah. I was. I, I've always been. I've been a rapier fighter since since I started, 
and I was the rapier marshal uh, for Tim and Tirza for at least part of the reign. And, and because I, I, I joke that I, I've been a royal officer for five, for five, uh, five coronets. I couldn't do it for six because I wore it because I am the sixth coronet. That's amazing. Was it? Uh, I, I had not held an officer role. I what we were on retinue with uh, Anne Marie and Fiac, and I did event steward a couple uh, banquets during that time. Um, but I, I uh, this is yeah, this is definitely my highest office. <laughs> So in, a, in addition to um, rapier, what were the kind of activities that drew you guys in? Well, I was really interested in how everyday life has lived in the Middle Ages from a much younger age. Like when I was in seventh grade and needed to write a paper, that's what I wanted to write it about. Um, and I, relatively speaking, minored in middle, middle medieval studies. They didn't have a program, so I don't have a degree in it, but I got a lot of great classes in that in college. So for me, I kind of wanted everything. Um, and I actually started doing rapier because that was the first people I met. And it took me a while to figure out that I didn't really love doing Renaissance, especially, and uh, found my way into doing uh, 15th century and, and from there and uh, took up pewtering uh, a long time ago, but certainly not right when I started. Uh, I, I certainly have always been interested in history and, and and once once I started doing rapier, I fenced a little bit in high school, and I just like the, the social aspect. And and I I've always been service oriented as well. So just general helping out makes me happy. And I I actually have a bachelor of science in theater, and really did a lot of community theater as well. And the SCA really fills the theater niche for us. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because I'm always really interested in how people incorporate their theater background into how they play. Well, well uh, do, do you want to go first? Um, what I studied was design. <laughs> and, and, and so it's the, it's the wanting to make things part of the SCA. I, I did because I was trying not to take acting classes, but uh, managed to get a degree. Uh, took a lot of voice for performance classes that have led to me being a very competent herald. And, and similarly, I was also from the technical side, but but I, I, I was around performance enough that that it does affect what I did, how I present myself in the SCA. Right now, I'm, I'm talking very close to to my normal. I am Willie. This is my speaking voice. If I'm talking in in Don slash Master Enzio, I, I deepen my voice just a little bit. And then when I'm up up on stage doing Baron Enzio, I drop a full octave to talk to everybody. And this way I can actually carry a room way back there without, without uh, people saying, oh, what did that guy say? And, but the being around theater has allowed, allowed me to, to do the presentation part a lot easier. So just an awareness of sight lines and uh, sort of the uh, situational awareness, because court is theater. We do it a lot. We do a lot of improv theater that way. Um, and also that it's, we were volunteering and making things happen in volunteer organizations. And that's very, very similar to the SCA. The SCA, you know, the community and the meetings and the planning and the nonprofit funding and all those things are, are pretty similar. And the juggling of personalities. Indeed. And, and deadlines and doing stuff at the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> it, one of the, the things that um, people kind of fall back on a lot and when they talk about SCA stuff is, you know, this is a volunteer run organization and you can't, it, it's often followed with, you can't expect much. And mm. <laughs> what I usually say is it's, it, it, we're a, a nonprofit and you get what you pay for. Um, but a way that you flip that into is you get what you put into it, what you, what you put into it. And when we all put our best into it, we get something really amazing. And and we, we have we, we have found and, and Spike especially that that when searching searching for volunteers, inviting people to come help is way more effective than will anybody help me? Because that that, that makes people people feel like the shiny hat person uh, knows who I am. This is great. I'd love to help, as opposed to uh, the the martyr complex, which is way too common in in. In volunteerism. 
Yeah, Pe- people need direction, and um, they they need to have a job. They can't. It, you can't just like put a thing out into the universe. You gotta pinpoint and and um, direct it at people. Uh, it's so much more effective. <laughs> yeah, people like to be asked personally um, by name. Yeah. Um, and, and that's extra work for whoever's organizing it. I mean, I, I have totally been guilty of putting a blanket call out for help with costuming. And um, I, I know that some of my hardcore helpers have to be asked personally, or they're like, whatever, they're not doing it. <laughs> so you have to balance that um, feeling like you're putting a burden on somebody by asking them and re- remembering that, um, it's a privilege that a lot of people want to have to be able to help. Yeah, yeah. That is one of the aspects of being Baron and Baroness that is odd is having retinue or not. And we have had very little retinue during our tenure. And part of that was that we didn't really need it. Uh, you know, it, we, we sort of jokingly sometimes sneak around carrying our own chairs, but um, there wasn't, there. Right now, the community in our barony didn't have people who were looking for those roles and stepping into that who needed to be brought into something. And so rather than burden other people who were busy with a lot of things, it's just been easier for us to shoulder that. But when people have said, can I retinue for you? I immediately say yes. And the only thing I can usually name for them to do is to make sure I have lunch. It's important, but- it's so I- important. <laughs> or help me put my hair up if, if we're if we're doing the hair up that's that's another thing I, I like to have help with but um you know because we were technical theater people we can usually set up our own court reasonably well <laughs> and we've had partially it's just that the people around us just did the work without saying oh I'm on retinue um Madalena has been our scribe for our entire tenure and she just does all the scribes scribal work and the award layout ahead of court we never had to ask somebody to do that she just has done it for us so wow and you, you mentioned earlier, you guys are on your sixth year, is that right? That's right. Um, we, uh, we actually right now are at the end of our fifth year. We okay. stepped up at an on pre that when it was in late September, I think. And uh, uh, we had originally planned to, well, we initially said, oh, we'll do three years. And then at three years, well, it's going okay. Barony seems to like us. Eh, we can keep doing this for a little while longer. And so we said we'd go to 4.75. And part of this was that Athenaeum was a good event to step down at. And part of this was, because we wanted to move it out of Ampris, being a a thing that the Ampris had to have. Um, But also it was that in talking to people who'd done the job, most people say, by year five, you're pretty done. At year six, you're totally done. So we were trying to shoot for ending before year five. And we could have. Um, That had been our stated intention. And with the pandemic and... Our barony has been really chill it's been really people in King County are being really cautious and really careful and the confidence polling at three years was entirely positive nobody had anything negative to say at that time so we said okay well we'll just we'll keep doing this for a little while but we're still hoping it'll be less than six years um, so maybe in the spring doubtful <laughs> <laughs> So what led you to um, think about taking on this job? Because it's it's a really big job. Uh, do, do, do you want me to start this one, Love? All right. So so we've been recommended, and this is one of the reasons why I love the re- re- recommend pe- people for Baron Baroness instead of just volunteering, because it really gets you to start thinking about Baron Bar- Bar- Baroness. We were nominated probably the last two, three times before we actually accepted. Four? Was it four? It, okay. it seems like it's been a lot, like many times. And we would always say, look, neither of us are peers. And there's so many peers in Madrona. We really feel like one of the coronets needs to be a peer. Which was a really good excuse for a long time. <laughs> um, and, and and truthfully, the reason why we we, we, we accept the job is because we, we, have, we have a good idea of what performance is. And, and what services. And, and we honestly, deep down, we, we actually love our barony. And we thought we'd do a good job. And that's, and that's why we stood as candidates. 
it, it right. really it came down to the more we thought about it that we wanted the barony to be well led we wanted to give that to the barony and it is um that we have a, a magnet on our fridge that says love it's a special kind of stupid <laughs> and in this case that was sort of what made that decision to stand as candidates was was love for madrona that's awesome i i love that they have a, a recommend because it's it's really powerful for someone else to see you in a role especially before you see yourself in it mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think it's hard for people to see themselves in that role without that prompt. Um, you know, it, it, it's not a role that's, because it's, it's, I mean, it's sort of bestowed upon you, but it's a lot of work. It's, it's hard to envision, I think, <laughs> um, until you're doing it. And it's sort of almost middle management in a lot of ways, too. Yeah. We are not actually the highest legal authority that the Seneschal is. Yeah. And so when I'm explaining it to, to people outside the SCA, I usually say it's a volunteer job that, that comes with a temporary, very shiny hat. Um, it, it's very funny because my legal de 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 definition that, that's on the paperwork for the bank is I'm assistant treasurer, which I think is, <laughs> which I think is awesome. <laughs> Madrona is a huge barony. Um, is is are there challenges with that that you guys have encountered? Yes. Not well, that we didn't expect. Madrona has always been, or at least in my twenty years, our twenty years, a peculiar set set of little in, groups of individuals. They don't always get 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 together, and my back my background my my educational background this might be in construction work this actually sociology and psychology, and mm -hmm. so I I might have picked up a little bit more that I uh, a previous baroness when I when we sought her advice said it was really surprising to her what people didn't like each other, <laughs> and because there's you know one or two people in each group who don't like somebody else in another group that may have happened 25 years ago that still happens. And so there's a lot of juggling of who plays well, to, well together. Um, and, and any difficulty we have is sometimes I think it's leftover baggage from things that have happened so long ago. <laughs> Anastasia. But I didn't want to name names, but yes, <laughs> may have left a bit of a mark <laughs> i have heard that before so <laughs> yeah um and i dealt with that 20 years ago as seneschal too so I, it, it's it's kind of astounding how long those things go on and it's been really interesting one of my apprentices is fairly new to the sca and new to this kingdom and um watching him try to juggle all of these like who gets along and who doesn't and why and and like he'll just look at me and go that was like 30 years ago that's like i was three and i'm like oh okay that's some perspective <laughs> i think that it's been very helpful to us uh, in our tenure that we had been in madrona for so long and that we had you know enzio had had been going to curia for five coronets. So he had a little bit and, and is a very good observer of people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so we had we had more preparation for that going in. And we also had a little more comfort than particularly our last, the, the two pairs that preceded us in being able to say, yeah, that's Madrona history and we can move on now. Um, Liz and Siri, even though they had been in Ontario for so long, still very much thought of themselves as outsiders who had came in from Kaid because they were treated so much as outsiders when they arrived. Palantir. Palantir, thank Palantir. you. Yeah. And um, Pembroke and Emelina, Pembroke was pretty new to Ontario and had sort of come back to the SCA and Emelina was almost entirely new to the SCA. They didn't have any of that history. And we've had a little more confidence to be able to say, yeah, we understand Madrona's like this and been able to make a few changes comfortably because of that um because, minor changes would not <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I, actually, I think you guys have made some pretty big changes um, in, in, I think, really positive ways. I, you're, you know, I, I believe you're the Baron and Baroness that um, got a, a rapier and fight practice inside with a bathroom, which was huge, like absolutely huge. Um, you know, like, you know, you were working on inclusivity um, before, you know, everybody was talking about it. Well, that's a, uh, yes, I think MZO gets a lot of credit for this, but also our community, the, the rest of the rapier community was uh, addressing that, and, and I think other members of the fight community as well, um, that it hasn't been a, a fight when we put up a, you know, all our welcome sign and, and had the idea that, whose idea was it, because I know that we asked Sean to make the, the graphic, and then it we- might, It might have been Gera, or it might have been Eden, I, I do not know. Yeah, it, one of our Seneschal's idea. Um, nobody objected that we put us, you know, nobody needed to make a scene and say, why are you doing that? It, it, what, it, it didn't, nobody gave us pushback about it, um, which is a, a good fortune of who, who's interacting here. Right. Was, was that part of, um, when you decided to take on the job, did you have sort of a checklist and was that part of what you wanted to get accomplished? So, we didn't really have we didn't we didn't have a checklist we, we knew we knew that that uh, uh, Majona being an old barony we going in with an agenda would, would, would just not be a good idea it's just not, not how things we 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 see ourselves as hosts to, to the entire SCA and especially the local populace and we we as as hosts want to welcome everybody and that's that's kind of our underlying principle and so every, everything we do goes back to that as opposed to having a checklist. That's, that's why when I have, have my, our martial champions, I decided to also make that be a demo event. That way people can see not just f fighting in a demo sense, but actually see what fighting actually, actually looks like. So they, you know, they don't, they don't c come in and, and uh, get surprised. That it's not a bunch of super chat, ch ch chatty fights. They can actually see what, what we do, what we do. Um, and, but, and the same thing with the, with the fight practices It actually, actually, uh, pain, pain, pain and Natasha are the ones who actually set us up, set us up, set, set us up with that, with that particular site. Cause now Natasha used to, we used to teach that, teach there. And it was, it was actually during, during, uh, Pembroke, Pembroke's range at, at the, at the very end, but, but. I, I will I will take a little bit of credit because I was the one who ran the practice for many many years be, before I even stepped up as as Baron. So, and and addressing the return to fight practices as the COVID cycle has moved through, um, having a accessible bathroom, um, being able to have a gender neutral bathroom if possible, but having that was a really important goal. Um, as I say, not simply for us, but among the rest of the fighting community, it was we, they looked at a lot of parks, they looked at a lot of places they could try to do that. And knowing that that is necessary for people to have to, for it to be an inclusive fight practice, having places where people can put body armor on and off and things like that was a thing we needed. And um, so that consciousness is a little bit from us, but a lot from our group. So what other, uh, when you look back at the last, uh, few years more before COVID than, than since, because we'll get to COVID as kind of a special thing. Um, what are some of the other changes that you've um, participated in and sort of watched happen and during your tenure? Well, there's the birth of Athenaeum, which, which, is, which is lovely, which was spearheaded by Charles and Christiana, um, which is a lovely event. And and actually, Her Excellency should talk more of it since it's more uh, on her, her side. Indeed. Um, and I think also, as you mentioned, um, making Lionhearts as a demo um, to, to, uh, to be our martial champions, but also to be um, a, a deliberate, to try to have a demo on our schedule again. For when we first started, Madrona did Greenspire and Kent Canterbury Fair. And those things had fallen away and nothing had really replaced them. And um, we're a big metro area that really ought to do a little more outreach. And so um, trying to make that happen as a demo was was definitely one of the things that we've done. Um, yeah, it was 
2020 looked like it was going to be an amazing year of amazing events and sort of everything that we'd finally come to fruition. We've been able to have OMPRI again after a couple years of having a lot of difficulty with site loss and so forth. And uh, we were going to be moving it to earlier in the year because the last one was so cold. And, uh, and, and Athenaeum, you know, coming into itself in the third year and, and getting its legs and going. And um, that isn't what happened, but uh, it, 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 it felt good if what we built was running in a good way. And Athenaeum has um, really transformed the arts community in this kingdom, I think. Um, and uh, having it online has been really kind of incredible. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about the challenges and, and the gift that that's end up, ended up being? Yeah. Um, so, you know, initially, uh, as we were looking at things earlier in 2020, as COVID started to come in and we understood that we needed to cancel in-person Athenaeum, um, we sort of said, yeah, there's the, I just don't think we have the bandwidth or the way to do this. And Alicia, uh, Alicia Dubois said, I totally think we can do this. I think, I absolutely think we could do this. I, I, and um, the team, you know, it isn't just us, it's a lot of people. And, and, you know, we're sort of there to give good ideas and good feedback, but mostly it was done by other people. Um, put it together in a really short period of time and um, with an amazing amount of dedication and hundreds of hours of work, literally hundreds of hours um, on more than one person's part. Um, and so it was, oh, okay, you know, are we gonna try to do this again next year? And we wanted to have it in person and that wasn't gonna happen in 2021. And um, they did a wonderful job of building on that. And, and I think what they didn't expect with the virtual was how important the support of in the first year, the, the the leadership team, and in the second year, they tried especially to make it support of one another of the artists um, in in how to present yourself in that format. And we had had plans and ideas about doing a series of uh, events or or things leading up to Athenaeum, calling the road to Athenaeum, to give people some of that for doing it in person. You know, how to putting together your display and thinking about what you want to focus on and things like that. Um, that has pivoted to being online, but how much education happened about how you present your art um, leading up to the event, which is different than education about doing or making things or researching things, the, the education about the presentation part of it and the freeing up of communication. I'm definitely the, the inspiration, the base part, the basic reason to do Athenaeum in the first place is that Artists shouldn't have to compete with each other. We should have a way to celebrate art and to get together and see each other's art and see what people are doing without scores, without yeah. judges. And um, I never wanted to compete as an artist and I did. I was Madrona's arts champion for a couple of years um, because somebody asked me to compete and I didn't want the Baroness at the time, Countess Elizabeth, to think that nobody wanted to be her champion. And I loved being her champion, it was really fun. but. The idea of winning at arts uh, wasn't something that that I felt. I'm not a very competitive person, and so it wasn't something I wanted. Um, and so, Athenaeum seems like a good idea, and was much bigger than the Athenaeum one was much bigger than Charles had thought it would be. I said, "Is this what you were expecting?" And he said, "This is about twice the size it is in Ostiora," <laughs> and it was our first one. And um, so it was obvious that a lot of the rest of the arts community and on tier felt the same way we did, that they wanted to share their art and wanted to see what other artists were doing. And that energy of seeing each other's art, not simply the laurel to non-laurel interaction is what I think is so amazing about it. And I definitely hope that there are ways that we can continue that moving forward. And we definitely heard from people how much the online Athenaeum also has transformed people and Athenaeum in person as well, because there are, a portion of people who don't want to spend more time on Zoom, who yeah. wonderfully and have a lot to offer at, at, at an in-person Athenaeum. And so we definitely hope that it will return in the future. I'll definitely be part of helping that happen, uh, even without the coronet on my head. But um, I think that some form of online Athenaeum 
should continue, particularly because of the geographic reaches of Ontario. Um, you know, I, one of the people I spoke with this last year was on Vancouver Island, and it's just terribly hard yeah. to get to and from. And, and hugely expensive. Hugely expensive yeah. and a huge amount of time. And of course, you know, I've never traveled there for an SCA event. And um, how could they, you know, come all the way down to Seattle for a day event? But at the same time, they were doing really neat art and it was really wonderful to, to see and interact with them. And they clearly also really appreciated it. And so for people who are more remote, sometimes geographically and sometimes because of uh, health reasons or they're a caregiver for someone, um, have other reasons why they can't come to every event. Um, I, I, I know someone in our barony, dear to us, is Nicolin, has a really high needs kid. And, um, you know, what she can play with is, is not as much, you know, and if Athenaeum was two hours away, she couldn't go. And so I definitely see that need. Uh, yeah. and, and I love the idea of artists feeling like they're part of a community rather than feeling like they're competing with one another. I really do too. And, and um, we both promised Charles uh, when we interviewed him that we would uh, enter into this year's Athenaeum. And um, putting together sort of a, a blog website thing has been a long time fear of mine. And uh, having the opportunity to do that through this event was a really big deal for me. And the amount of support and like you said, education that your team put in was kind of astounding. Um, and literally hundreds, like like 10 or 15 people maybe putting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours in. It was it was mind blowing. And it was an incredible experience. Um, so thank you everybody who worked on that because wow, it was amazing. Our profound gratitude to everyone, as I said, it, it, a lot, it was a lot more hours by other people than us. And um, uh, Definitely, um, Rowena Demanning and uh, Alicia and Aaron, Aaron Carino and um, Dara was one of the tech leads. And I'm not naming everyone. <laughs> There's a lot of people I'm missing in, in the names I'm throwing out. Kyrie, Kyrie uh, definitely put in a lot as well. It it is um, funny thing. Uh, several months ago, I had hit a oh, I'm not sure we're doing that well as Baron and Baroness. You know, some other branches have done more virtual courts are given out more awards. And I was like, hold up. We've held three large virtual events. I mean, big, like hundreds of people involved in them. We're doing okay. <laughs> okay. How has, how has that been challenging for you to have to move online? Were you, are, are, the, are the two of you, were you already sort of uh, tech savvy or was that a, a huge learning curve for you? Oh, uh, I believe we're not so, uh, we, we're decently tech savvy enough. I mean, we can't do the infrastructure, but 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 z we, we adapted to Zoom fairly, fairly soon. Yeah, uh, I got a Zoom account pretty early on um, because it was obvious this is where we were socializing and where we were interacting. And so that's where my entertainment dollars made sense to go. Um, but what's odd is that we both actually work in the trades. We don't work in front of computers. Um, and we're very much in the minority <laughs> in the SCA in that I'm, a, I'm an upholsterer and uh, and is a, a glazier. And so um, it is a little odd in that we're not synced in all the time the way some other people are. And um, But that's also good. We have, I think, a little energy to be in front of the computer because we weren't in front of the computer for work most of the time. Sometimes you have to attend some some work Zoom meetings. And I, I did a few uh, in, in the really cautious period of the of the pandemic a few uh bids and i did a lot of bids from from photographs but a few where i actually had them you know zoom around a little bit but yeah i, I um i think we've relied a lot on the tech savvy of our bearing <laughs> there's a lot of tech savvy people around us awesome um and how have courts gone for you? Have you, um, I know that our kingdom kind of put forward, uh, you could either have a live court and not record it, or you could record the court in advance. What, which path, how did you uh, choose to um, approach that? 
Uh, uh, we, 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 all our courts have been recorded, and, we, and we've done very minimal court, I, I have to admit. Um, because mo mostly our courts are little introductory, welcome to the event, th thank the people working on the event profusely and 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 then a you know thanks to everybody for coming you know tip 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 your waiters and waitresses afterwards we've had one real court that we've given out given out awards yeah and that and that was for Athenaeum this year we and it's been pre-recorded we definitely went pre-recorded because nothing ensures a power outage or a sudden internet outage like relying on a, a live feed uh, <laughs> so uh definitely safer for everybody to have it pre-recorded and then of course uh you can stop and record again we tried to do it pretty quickly so there there weren't a ton of re-records and we tried to leave some of the awkwardness and humor in it because i think people react really well to that um i w i didn't want to do a ton of online courts because one thing that i realized before i was baroness actually when i received um a, a jean de leon um was that I, I received it from the Crown and it was at a on pre and it wasn't a crown I was particularly close with. It didn't, the moment with the crown didn't mean a lot to me. But the rest of that day, well, that evening, as we were wrapping up, all sorts of people from my barony came up to me to tell me, congratulations, that's so well deserved. I'm so glad you received that. And I realized that a lot of receiving the award isn't just the moment in court with the shiny hat person, it's the rest of your community saying yes and we love you and you're right and we're so glad we got that and that matters a lot and so doing virtual courts misses that but then at the same time we have this problem of we haven't thanked people for two years right like we didn't want it we didn't want to be there either and so we'll probably do a little bit of a sort of callback of the courts we've done to to thank people in person when we can have an audience we hope uh so that they can receive some of that love from their community that was my uh, not top reason for not doing more online court was was wanting people to receive the love of their community as well. And, and I think a lot of a lot of different heads of baronies and kingdoms have made that that choice. Um, it's just been very interesting to watch how uh, how different people have made different choices and why. That's why I ask. Well, and I think I think different communities have different needs. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, Madrona, again, is a, a largely fairly mature barony. Um, a lot of people who've been playing for a long time or, and uh, we've had a lot of people sort of new to the barony in the last number of years. And a lot of them moved here from other places and, and were brought in their out of kingdom perspective, which is really cool. Um, but they're not, they're, they didn't feel like there was a need of people who, who were lacking recognition who never been recognized and, and and sometimes because we we live among giants more more lions than i can you know than we can possibly uh, even count on on the top of our head but because this last this last uh athenaeum uh rowena did so much work so much work and and we struggled with what 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 we could do do for her because we wanted to give her the recognition she deserved but she has every award, <laughs> everyone. So and so we and, and so we we actually gave gave her our, our personal favor because there was nothing else we we can give, we we could give her. But it's that's another just, it's another challenge of being a part of an old old mature barony that sometimes people doing the work, it's really hard to recognize. Yeah. What what do you do to think of Viscountess uh, Pelican Laurel? You know, like how. how they already had a green leaf. They're already a red branch. They're already, you know, and, um, but they deserve recognition. I think people deserve a huge amount of recognition. When you look at the OP, sometimes there's people who are playing and they haven't gotten an award in 20 years. You know, they, they were receiving awards when I was in kindergarten, <laughs> you know, and I'm, and I'm in my forties. <laughs> well, at the power of a thank you and a personal token, um, I can't emphasize enough how important that is. Um, you know, I've done a lot of costuming for Reigns and getting like a personal thank you card that's not even a word attached is so meaningful. You know, it's something that I put up on my bulletin board and I keep forever. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't think that um, that kind of personal token and that kind of thing thank you uh, should be underestimated because it's a big deal. Yeah. 
It's a wonderful thing. In a way, I, I was glad we hadn't given one out before yet at that point because it placed a higher value on it uh, mm -hmm. to give it that rarity. Awesome. She needs like um, an award named after her, like the Rowena. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> She's so amazing. She's yeah. very amazing. For like 20 years of sustained service to the barony of Madrona. The Rowena. <laughs> Anyway, there, there we go. That should be a thing. <laughs> we'll suggest that to our successors. <laughs> if I ever do the job. No. Um, anyway. She's watching, by the way. Yeah, give, 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 some, give some thoughts. Uh, 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 if you're interested, because, you know, opportunities will be presented, we hope, in the next year. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Can we talk about um, your art journey a little bit? Like, what do you do and how did you get interested in it? Well, so in addition to making clothes, which I wouldn't say I, I'm not a costumer because I don't tend to make them for people besides Enzio and I, but I do make up our clothes. Um, and my mom was a professional seamstress. I learned to sew before I learned to read. Um, and she wrote a book on pattern alteration when I was an infant. So wow. a pretty good foundation. It's been interesting trying to get her help shifting to SCA things where, no, we're not, we're not going to do this as a pattern. I need you to pin this fabric around me. Um, but I, have, I had a lot of that foundation going in. And then I did study theater design and a lot of medieval studies in college. So I had, had a lot of that research foundation. The art that I practice as an art is is making pewter things, um, carving soapstone molds and casting pewter. Um, I learned that from uh, Master Sean, who had learned it from uh, Mistress Emery, uh, Her Excellency Emery, and uh, who'd learned it from uh, Master Mark de Gauquin. And uh, there's different learning and teaching styles. And some of it was great fortune that the first stone I picked up, I took a four hour class. And at the end of the four hour class, I finished carving and it cast perfectly. That hasn't happened since then. <laughs> Pomegranate, it's one of my best tokens. It's really thin. There was something miraculous about that piece of stone. Um, but I love, uh, I love pouring molten metal <laughs> into stone. I love making things. I like that they can be remade and that it's a really very low tech art. You can, you can melt pewter over a charcoal. I usually use an electric pewter pot. Um, but, uh, and you can, soapstone carves really easily. I usually look for stones that I can scratch with a fingernail um, for ease of carving. I have worked in some harder stone. It is a lot harder. Um, uh, it is hard to do things because it is working in negative and reverse. And so it's a challenging way to think that way. Um, but in terms of a craft and, and making things, uh, it's, it has suited me really well. I, I don't, th I think I started doing pewtering before I was an upholsterer, but it's also nice that it's entirely different than the trade I do. And, and when you work in a trade, it is hard. It's hard to want to come home and make stuff when your arms are tired from making stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, definitely uh, it works a physically harder job than I do. And um, so I would say that my art has languished a certain amount just because I don't feel like doing it <laughs> a lot, um, but I love that it's, pewtering is also the, it's the cheap plastic jewelry of the Middle Ages. It's the common person's thing. And the site tokens, it, I love pewter site tokens because so many of the pewter badges that exist were pilgrimage badges. You literally bought them to show that you'd gone to a place and done a thing. And that's exactly what a site token is. <laughs> so in terms of a medieval, reason for being applied to our SCA activities, it's, it's brilliant that way. And it's, it's ended up being really uh, useful for, for some other things because you can, you can do a lot with pewter. I, I work in lead-free pewter, but my, my laurel collar, that it's like a, a livery collar that looks like laurel leaves are gold-leafed pewter. But they're actually the same leaves that make the green leaf award for Madrona. Cool. Um, do you have, uh, so I, we haven't mentioned this, but you are wearing a laurel pin. You are a laurel. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't make this one. This is made by Alicia the Willful. Beautiful. Um, do you have students? I do actually. I actually surprised myself and took an apprentice um, at uh, Ursula Miss uh, 2020. <laughs> um, uh, Aurora uh, Pringle 
is my apprentice. Uh, she's very well known for making the cute uh, dolls, uh, the beautifully dressed dolls. Uh, uh, one of the pictures I shared is, is a picture of our dolls that she has made. Um, and she was a person I was friends with. And I actually saw her say, oh, I'm not sure I'm ever going to find a laurel. I'm like, oh, maybe I could do that. But I hadn't been an apprentice to somebody else. Um, I had been part of a community around me. There were a lot of people who were laurels. And so I didn't, I didn't personally, that wasn't a relationship I needed. Um, uh, and I'd been in the SCA a long time and I wasn't, I didn't want to be a laurel for a long time. For a long time, I said, don't bother discussing me. It's not a, it's not a thing that's important to me. And justifiably, one of my reasons was I never wanted to sit in meetings to discuss who else should sit in meetings. And it is the worst part of peerages. <laughs> is that you do. But what I discovered, particularly as a Laurel at our regional meetings, was that actually you sit in meetings and talk about really cool art that people are doing and what can we do to support and encourage them. And that part of the job is amazing. Yeah. What's good about being a Laurel is, is recognizing and bringing forth the art and enabling artists and, and helping them become what they can be. And um, I'm glad I, agreed to consider doing, I mean, I said, okay, yeah, you can, you can consider me, I guess. And I'm glad I became a Laurel for that reason, uh, to, and, um, helpfully Aurora, uh, is, is pretty chill on the whole. And so we have a pretty chill relationship and that's going well so far, but it, it didn't have a lot of SCA time yet. <laughs> yeah. How are you, how are you fostering, uh, during the pandemic? Are you mostly doing zoom stuff or? Not a lot, uh, because we, we didn't we didn't have a lot of established pattern of interaction um, pre pandemic. Um, I've done uh, some some drop bys. She she lives uh, down in Kent, um, and uh, so we're not terribly far apart. Uh, and uh, so we we have done some visiting, and I have encouraged uh, her Etsy store <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I haven't felt like I needed to make her make art. Um, uh, I given that the dress that was underway uh, pre-pandemic is hanging in my home untouched uh, 18 months later, I um, I don't have a lot of grounds for telling other people what to do. Uh, yeah. But I do try to be a person who says, yeah, I think, I think you're capable. I think you can do that. And also you don't have to. I think I've done a lot more if you don't have to. Yeah, same. I, I think it's important to recognize that um, we're in super strange times. And uh, if you are not functioning in that way and, and don't have the inspiration to do that kind of work, um, you're not missing out on anything and you're not going to get passed over for anything. It's not going to hurt you. Yeah. Um, if yeah. you're inspired and you make stuff, that's awesome. Right. You know, and we can yeah, but say, that. what were you doing in 2020? What were we all doing? <laughs> <laughs> And you guys have students as well. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, um, who who were your mentors in in Zio, and do you have students? Uh, my 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 main mentor in fencing was uh, Maestro Balthazar. Uh, I I was his cadet because I was back in back in those days. Um, I've had four official students. Um, I had two cadets, and they. Both um, Sarah Comey and Ginevra, unfortunately, they both retired from fencing before the 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 mod thing happened because of health reasons. So so I I I I I do not believe in the weird ranking system some some of my fellow mods have with different cadets and and provosts because students they're just students. <laughs> um, so were you a white scarf first? Yes, I was a white scarf first. Um, I, I received my white scarf about 10 years ago. Um, and then I also have two, 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 two provosts, uh, uh, soon, soon to be laureled Madalena, uh, and also, uh, Donia Tamekin, but that is, that is merely as an advocate, advocate role because, well, she, 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 she received her white scarf before I did and, and, for, for for me to try to teach teach her any more any more fencing besides the twenty years of us fighting together is is kind of a silly idea. Um. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I mean, 
I, I enjoy teaching. I often do t- teaching at the practices when I go. Right now, unfortunately, I'm reco- still recovering from a concussion, so I have not been the last, last month or so. But uh, I've, I've always enjoyed teaching. I, I, I very much like teach, teaching systems in, in, in fighting. And I never, I never like to teach anybody something to do while fighting without them know, knowing why they're doing it. Because in my mind, fighting, fighting, fighting is an intellectual thing, and your primary goal is not to die. And so, therefore, every, every, everything you do, do in a fight leads to that first. And then, you know, striking your opponent is, is, a, is a great way to not die, but <laughs> only if you don't die first. MZO's uh, mod collar has a motto in Latin on it that uh, translates as, he is always thinking. <laughs> nice. So, so if I were to ask you are, you, are you more of a physical training fighter or more of a thinking fighter? You're a thinking fighter. I'm a thinking fighter. Um, it's... Uh, Because if if it weren't obvious obvious from the names, all all my students happen to be female, and so nobody I teach shares my body type, and so I have to teach theory and sound theory, so 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 it so it works works for everybody. So I I can't I can't tell t- tell anybody oh just be a three hundred pound construction worker go there overpower them because that doesn't work. <laughs> unless that's you and and so yes i'm very much a think of fighting and when i teach somebody to fight i don't want i don't want them to fight like me i want them to fight like them and so that requires both thought on their on their part and my part um and i I take it that you are doing practice in person now or the barony is um, when there wasn't in-person practice, how were you, um, were, were you taking a break or were you continuing to talk about theory and stuff? We, we, we were most, mostly take, taking a break. I mean, we, it would come up because I, I am friends with, all my, with my students. So we, we, we talk about it, but there wasn't a lot of, uh, of theory being pa- 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 passed forth. And, you know, and, part, and there's always the guidance of, as a peer of just, how the society works is another piece of advice that I can pass along, which did happen dur- during the pandemic. Yeah, a lot of those discussions going on during the pandemic. It's been um, a lot. Oh, oh no! <laughs> One moment, I feel naked. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he had the forethought to stop his camera. I would have just gotten up and fumbled. <laughs> it's for the best. Well done, NCO. Yes. Yay. Good job. <laughs> I had started this with blue tape and added push pins to it because I was afraid of just that happening. To me. <laughs> we, we didn't uh, necessarily explain that the reason we're on two screens. We're not in separate rooms of the same house. I'm on Bainbridge Island, which is where my workroom is. And I'm here Monday through Thursday of every week now. I used to go home on Tuesday nights when I commuted by foot uh, through four forms of public transit, which we're not doing right now. And so uh, MZ is at home in, in Madrona and I'm technically in Dragon's Lair at the moment. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I work in Dragon's Lair <laughs> and have for 17 years. Oh, well, that's really cool. So a lot, you have of a-, a lot of commuting. That is a for a long time. I have always I had spent Monday and Wednesday nights on the island, in part because that way I can see people in the evening who work during the day, and then I get to take Friday off, which is really wonderful. Okay, cool. Um, Rifkin, do you have any questions? Well, do you want to look at some pictures? I think that would be great. All right, cool. I will bring them up. We're gonna pull those up. Great. Can we see that? Yep. All right. So that's, that's my first Burgundian, uh, a wool, wool Burgundian gown and short hennen with a veil. This was taken at a uh, Madrona Baronial Banquet when Anne Marie was still Baroness. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly when, but that'll roughly date it. And uh, 
And Zio's doublet is made from beautiful upholstery fabric. <laughs> and this is back when I had uh, I had hair. I had long flowing locks, uh, which uh, which I eventually cut off because uh, the skull is not a good look. <laughs> oh, yeah, Spencer's very early on. I do still have that doublet, and I can still wear it because um, I, I have a skirt that it goes with. But yeah, we were we were both young rapier fighters once once upon a time. Enzio looks actually remarkably similar. <laughs> like um. I, Ju ju judging me. by the swords I'm wearing, this had to be within our first two years of, fe of fencing. So this is between 99 and 2001, I would guess. What event do you think that is? Somebody thought it was uh, the Lion Hearts down the fairgrounds, but we're not sure. Yeah, what? the Even Claw Fairgrounds is a good guess. I think that's what it is. That's what it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, this spike the boy <laughs> <laughs> that's my really fabulous uh, i love that outfit but it has to be like under 65 degrees outside for me to wear it um because it's a it's a perp i made a per point that would also act as a supportive kirtle and um they're lovely thick wool hose and then a lightweight wool uh uh coat with the daggy sleeves and a wool a uh, chaperone that also works as a hood, and it's lovely. But uh, any more than sixty-five, you can't wear that. <laughs> so, um, before we went live, we kind of uh, when you put your um, pronouns in your title, um, you said that you would like to talk about that. So, um, yeah, you, she and he listed. So, she and he. well, so I mentioned that um, you know I, I started in fighting and then hit this point where I was like, wait, I never wanted to do the Renaissance. I like the medieval period. Um, my sister had given me a DVD ROM, this will date how long ago it was, <laughs> by uh, the French Bibliothèque Nationale and some other organizations in France that was um, manuscript images. And it, it had an English translation, but it was a little, it, you can't use it anymore. It was like a website <laughs> version of it. So when you use it now, it's all in French. Um, but I was just paging through images and I saw this image that absolutely looked like a person wearing a fencing mask. And it was from a 15th century illumination and he was a beekeeper. Wow. But it really looked like a modern fencing mask, not, not the sort of round disc beekeeper that you see in the 16th century things. It really had that curve, just like a fencing mask. And I was, that's it, I love that. And as I started to look into 15th century and, and uh, Anne-Marie was somebody who was doing a lot of 15th century recreation around me and, and had a lot of info and answers. Um, it's a very, ex the Burgundian dukes, which are, um, it's, it's a line that starts from the brother of the King of France and, and really reign through the, the early and middle uh, 15th century and, and end up controlling a huge amount of what is now France and, and Central Europe, um, or middle Western Europe, I guess. But uh, uh, they're fascinating people to study and recreate because they are consciously trying to create themselves as medieval monarchs during the medieval period. And so a lot of the things they did are very consciously presentational um, and it runs right into the tournament era very much. And there's an, a, it's also a point where we're seeing a real explosion of art that is not purely religious. Uh, the um, books of hours and um, and more secular painting. So there's an abundance of images to work from. There's a lot of literature to work from. There's a lot of books from that time period, um, but it's still really medieval and they're still trying to show themselves off as medieval people. And so it makes a really exciting time period to study. So I um, decided I was a, uh, I, I would be a, a boy from uh, Zealand, which is uh, a region of Holland now, but uh, uh, it was a, a independent region at the time. And it's very different geographically than it was in the Middle Ages now. Uh, a lot of it's been uh, drained and, and filled. So it was much more islands than it is today. Um, but I said, I, I'm a beekeeper from Zealand and eventually dropped fencing and kept uh, kept being a beekeeper from Zealand. And that beekeeper made their way to Bruges and learned pewter craft and found their way into this court of Antir. Very cool. <laughs> um, but I still really love it. And I had picked the name a long time ago off of um, list St. Gabriel's list, you know, the the well-researched by Harold's list. You can just pick a name from and it's all good. And my important lesson to everybody is when you find a name you like on St. Gabriel, print that page out 
because I used it for a couple of years and I went back to look into documenting it and, 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 you know, submitting my paperwork and the name wasn't on the list. And I was able to write to the person who created it and edited it and learn that she had concluded that it was a prepended by name. It's like calling somebody Smitty whose last name is Smith. Uh, is a, a modern example we know well. Um, and Spiker exists as an occupational by name. It means nailer. Spike does mean nail. And um, <laughs> you can register that as Spike Marie last name. And I, I'd already picked Zoo Tart, which translates as Sweet Tart, and I really love that. <laughs> um, and uh, so I am registered as uh, Spike Dirk Zoo Tart. And so technically, my first name is Dirk. Um, I only go by that usually at Peasants Revel, <laughs> usually when you see me as, as Dirk. But um, I, am, I appreciate that one of the wonderful things about the SCA is that we get to be who we want, choose to be, and we can choose to be a different person every day, every event, every hour if we choose. And um, that includes getting to be playful with our gender. And I recall at one point we were lined up for a processional for a Madrona event and we'd filled out our cards and I not think had written her lordship. And Kiri said, is that what you meant to write? And I was like, sure, go for it, that's right. And I <laughs> had myself introduced as her lordship. And uh, so I, I want to encourage everyone to be playful with their gender if they choose to be. And just as we can be different time periods and different places, we can also choose our gender. And that that is freeing and empowering to our lives outside of the SCA as well. Absolutely. So so this this is a peasants revel and peasants revel is a lovely event that that the culinary guild has run for many many years, 40 years plus now. And this is just me having a good time with with our with a good friend Mr. Stemekin. <laughs> That's, that's me as Spike again. Uh, I love being Guillaume's Herald at the Ampris. Uh, high on the list of reasons not to become Baroness was that I couldn't be uh, Guillaume's Herald <laughs> was the Baroness. And I look forward to returning to that role in the future. Um, but uh, that's, that's why I'm wearing their chaperone there. But I think the smile says how much I like it. <laughs> Uh, this this is this is me this is uh, Spike tying tying my white scarf onto me. This uh, event was about ten years ago. It it, it was a very special court uh, for uh, uh, Sir Rifkin there too, too as well. <laughs> mine was a surprise though. Was yours a surprise? Mine was mine was mine was oddly not 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 a surprise because uh, well it, it was very uncommon. They'd actually offered offered me at, at September Crown, which was about two weeks beforehand. And because they didn't have a scroll and and Balthazar wasn't present, they said they'd actually award it two weeks later, which is which was very uncommon for for White Scarf at the time. So no, it was not a surprise for me. And and that's why I was wearing a. Uh, it, there might be another picture. You'll see a little pink scarf uh, tied from, tied around my leg to instigate that I was kind of in between. <laughs> <laughs> well, your your doublet is gorgeous really beautiful that was that was outfit was made by truly i think we, if we have another picture of, of him in the full outfit uh she made that in that two weeks wow yeah. we're also out of town visiting his family for a week of yeah, that. it was also the weekend between those two events was my mom's 80th birthday and so i actually flew back to the midwest while she was yeah. making this she's an amazing friend in person wow I love this picture. <laughs> this, this is this is us. Uh, September Crown, uh, probably the September Crown before we stepped up. So this is still during the reign of uh, Pembroke and Emelina, and this is uh, I'm wearing the rapier champion regalia and just uh, goofing off, goof, goofing off in the Madrona Pavilion. That's definitely Enzio telling a story face. <laughs> but I, I really like that too, and I'm wearing my heart shaped veil crooked. <laughs> <laughs> picture that is not at the center, but it looks merry that way. It does. This is a very merry picture. <laughs> this is her actually taking taking a twelfty, that, 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 and having fun. Learning to take twelfties was a skill I had to to put out some effort to acquire. 
And, uh, and so uh, that's uh, Eleonora and Cesare with us. And uh, um, uh, those are the earrings I'm wearing are my few, first pewter badge that was pornographic that I made myself. <laughs> I always hear <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah, you really have to look closely at it. They, it, it. they are the exact size of the original, but it's quite pornographic when you see it up close. They make great earrings because it just sort of looks like a feathery tree until you look a lot closer. Um, the uh, the pornographic uh, badges bring me great joy. I love them. <laughs> I uh, will add that, that if you need a reason to come to Twelfth Night 2022, uh, Donia Tomekin, who is actually the primary pewter pornographer, I have largely been the pimp of said pewter because encouraging and sharing the pornographic pewter is a lot of what I do. Um, she is working on uh, tokens to have as our site tokens for uh, uh, Twelfth Night, so uh, there will be pornographic site tokens available at, at Twelfth Night. There will be non-pornographic site tokens as well. Yeah. You, you have to request the uh, the risque ones. Well, with, with Twelfth Night, because so many fewer uh, people under 18 attend Twelfth Night, um, we were able to have them when we did, uh, ooh, 2014 was the last time we did a set of uh, pewter site tokens for, for Twelfth Night. It was the year I stepped up, uh, or was elevated as Laurel. and um, Tomekin's, uh, they were all purse, purses, and mine was the purse with the chain handle, and um, Morgan Donner did the beautiful purses that she painted all of them with checky or ombre patterns. Those were very, very popular. Also very popular was Donya Tomekin's always popular bag of dicks purse. <laughs> well, still a big seller. <laughs> very cool. This is the procession for, our, again, Donia Tomekin's uh, uh, yeah. laureling. Um, you cannot see it. In a, I'm wearing paper wings in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this picture. And it was Ian and Gwyneth on the, on the throne. And I was one of the speakers for her. And uh, I started doing my, started doing my, doing my speech. And uh, His Majesty asked me to continue flapping as I gave my speech. And so I had to do this majestic flapping motion as trying to honor my friend <laughs> during during court. But this 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 shows the sense of whimsy we like to have at, at most events. The, the the procession was inspired by the Abbott's Bromley Mummers dance, uh, which is still done and they've carbon dated the antlers used in England for that to like thousands of years ago. Um, uh, but Tomekin's arms on her uh, heraldry are a winged pomegranate, so that's what MGO is representing. There. Yeah, I'm dressed as a winged pomegranate. <laughs> what do the antlers stand for? Like, it's just I I don't know all the symbols of the of the ceremony. Yeah. And it's just a cute uh, picture of us in the costumes. <laughs> it's a great yeah. photo. Oh, and you you actually the session, I was carrying the cheese. Uh, for camp, from I carried a plate of cheese to represent our camp. Yes, and, and the doublet itself is dirty too. The 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 uh, stomacher, the four panel of it, was actually made by my mother, and uh, uh, my workroom is attached to her house. So when I'm at work, uh, she's around, and uh, so she had offered to make this for us. She had the silk, and she she trapuntoed it, and she comes in and says, "Oh, I have an idea. Since Tomekin makes the pornographic pewter, what if I included pornographic shapes in the in the pomegranate seeds?" Yes, that's an excellent idea, Mom. You should definitely do that. So, yeah, that shape you see next to the uh, good to song he was awarded, uh, he we literally had to unpin the wings from him for him to go receive the good to song because they didn't know he was getting ready to be in a procession and <laughs> okay. in that court order. Um, so he had just received that. That is laying over a little funny bit. Awesome. That is me doing pewtering at a Dragon Slayer uh, June Fair demo. Uh, and so that is the happy smile of showing people molten metal. Wonderful. <laughs> so I, I included this picture because it reminds me of one of the funnier offhand comments in our camp. This was the event where I was offered my laurel and we were at dinner afterwards. Everyone's a little tired and tipsy and happy. And and says, I don't know. I can't see anything on that side of the table. All I see is veils and cleavage. I may have said that. 
that, that, that is uh, the amusing look of all I see is fails included. <laughs> Madrona and and Fromage they do such an incredible job of a period encampment. Um, do you guys all coordinate that? So Camp Fromage exists. We're not a household in that there's no head of household and, and none of that hierarchy. We're literally a group of friends who like to camp together. Um, and we needed a name to put on camp reservations and we all love cheese. Uh, so Camp Fromage was the winner. Um, certainly we do, we coordinate what, who brings what, and uh, we bring uh, often a lot of the kitchen hardware. We're usually team kitchen, uh, team breakfast. Uh, um, we bring the bacon and the oatmeal and- um, And the kitchen shade. Brings what they can according to their need and ability. People with smaller cars don't bring as many of benches and chairs as, people with trucks and roof boxes. It's, it's difficult to manage more than 16 people in a camp. That's the other thing we've definitely learned is that um, we, for food especially, and it's very hard to manage food when everybody's busy and has lots of meetings to attend. Poor Enzio, uh, we have fewer and fewer people left in our encampment uh, for him to have breakfast with if there's a Laurel meeting early. <laughs> <laughs> So, so th th this is after Ampri or the evening of Ampri. I believe this is the one where I was the autocrat, and 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 Spike was uh, heralding all day, volunteering all day. So this is the sitting down, looking in opposite directions, completely exhausted, but still very happy. You both have kind of a glow. Ah. <laughs> uh. these, these are our cards from the uh, Fromage and Friends uh, card deck that. Um, Morgan Donner and Mekin uh, produced. Every card is an individual representation of somebody. Um, I am the uh, the under of acorns, and Enzio is the the king of swords. All of the kings are depicted uh, riding, and he is riding a bear in the pomegranate crown for the because uh, we we were not baron and baroness at the time. And I am shown uh, holding a cheese wheel and a pewter axe. I, I love that deck of cards. It's amazing. It's amazing. I'm very pleased that it, it is also in the Bainbridge Island Art Museum uh, book arts collection. It, it was purchased by them. So uh, it, it can actually be viewed in a museum here. Wow. Uh, th this, is us, this is us processing for uh, as, as Spike was elevated to the Order of Lore. Such a gorgeous dress. Yeah, really beautiful. That, the silk from that gown, my sister is a tour guide professionally. She's a, a trip planner and tour guide for Butterfield and Robinson, which is a high-end biking and walking tour company. And she guided in uh, Thailand and Vietnam a few years long ago. Mostly she's been in France and Italy. And uh, she said, what do you want me to bring you from Thailand? I said, well, bring me silk. And she brought me six yards of hand-woven fair trade silk. And I was terrified to use it for anything and after about nine years, when I was offered a laurel and I hadn't used it for my wedding dress, I said, okay, I need to figure out if I can use this, this fabric. And so I'm, it, the outfit is based on the, the Doan triptych uh, at the Met. It's around 1478, I think. And uh, um, the gold silk of the collar and cuffs is also um, from silk that my sister brought me from wow. Thailand. And truly, uh, truly also made my hat. My, that Henan was made by Truly. And sent to me. She was in Minnesota at the time when she did make it. It's a fun. It's a fun dress to wear. I wore it to almost every event for six months after that that I could. That was indoor because I was terrified it wouldn't fit me later. And it's worked out really well. I've been able to wear it for several years. Awesome. Uh, Rowena is asking if you said uh, the fromage deck is in a museum. So can you repeat that again? Yes, the Bainbridge Island Art Museum. Or Bima, so Museum of Art, Greenridge Island Museum of Art, um, has a large book arts collection. Temekin is actually a book artist and librarian in her modern life, and uh, her book arts are also in other collections, but I know that the deck of cards was purchased by that collection, and uh, friends of mine did visit the museum when it was on display and were able to look through the cards looking for, for our cards. That's so cool. 
is there a copy of, of the deck? I um they I I believe that they only made a couple painted decks, um, but that there are unpainted decks that they did sell. Uh, okay. They're about fifty. They are, they are printed, so they are blocks that that are printed, um, but then the color is all hand painted in. Uh, this is just during a procession during a baronial banquet. <laughs> the, I, think that, I, I think that's the post elevation ceremony hug. <laughs> So this would be our first court as Baron and Baroness. Um, our, I think that's our champion swearing in in front of us. I believe so. And that is us entering before we were uh, made Baron and Baroness. So that, that our bare heads, with our uh, supporters behind us, there's Tometkin holding the cheese finial, <laughs> that cheese. This was the Grand Prix in Aquaterra. Uh, so this is us in court outside, um, and and me talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Addressing the populace. <laughs> There's our dolls. Uh, so um, Aurora had made me my doll before she was my apprentice, and and. Part of the apprenticeship ceremony, the gift she gave me was the Enzio doll, and I had been able to get to the fabric from his garb to make the doll with. Oh, that's so cool. And fortunately, Enzio did register that badge. His arms are the red and white with the wavy line between them, counterchanged with a bear and a unicorn. And getting a bear and a unicorn in a, you know, centimeter high arm <laughs> isn't really plausible. So I'm really delighted that he got that registered as badge, and that definitely is his badge. <laughs> much easier <laughs> and those look like really tiny little pewters next to the dolls the, that's pewter on my that's my haversack next oh, to okay it. so um the the patents are the this main one that you see that they're the shoes um in some of the pictures we've seen i'm wearing that as a necklace um that that is a pewter mold that's cast flat and then the straps of the patent are bent up around to create that three-dimensionality Hmm. The sort of flowery tree next to it is uh, the token that we made actually as our favor for our weddings. And it is one that we sometimes use as a personal token. It is what we uh, presented for Rowena as, as our personal token. Um, some of the other badges on there are other people's work. Uh, the hexagonal um, uh, annular brooch uh, is uh, one that uh, Sean made, uh, I think, for Anne Marie. And the crown, oh, sorry, never mind. We don't need to go in. Just... <laughs> the crown was a site token made by uh, somebody in, uh, I think, Three Mountains. Uh, it, was, it was at a Three Mountains 12th night that I received that site token. Cool. Very cool. Uh, this is me swearing fealty as a, as a master of defense on, on Her Majesty's crown. That is also what I swear fealty to when I, when I, uh, became a peer. I swore fealty on his majesty's crown because I thought it would be easier for him to take his crown off. Than her? In that particular reign, I think it probably was. It was Ian and Gwyneth. And it was, I think, just the king had, the king had less on his head. Yeah. What, um, Enzio, why did you choose her majesty's crown? Is it because of the relationship? It's because of the relationship between the mods. And I had a little little preamble in my ceremony that, that, that I, uh, well, strength, strength and arm is one thing, but I'm nothing without grace to guide me and wisdom. I, I forget the po po poetry I wrote for it, but 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 very much it's because of the relationship between between the fence community and the queen. Awesome, I love that. I love this picture. This is us being. Uh, Enzio is presenting uh, me as his consort to compete in the Queen's Rapier Championship. Uh, oh, I think Sarah the Braves holding the banner behind us is one of the privileges of being Baron and Baroness is you get to, to have that banner behind you when you process. And, those and, and, 
and it's very neat to, to go through, you know, who you are. This is my consort and part of the introductions to, 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 to the match seasons. And I am keeper of your lands with Jonah as, as, as you fight. <laughs> Look at that Motley crew. I love this too because this shows how the Madrona Baronia Pavilion is the Barony's living room at events. And not just the Barony, there's there's people definitely who aren't Madronans in this shot. Um, but uh, that was at a September Crown uh, up in BC. Uh, it was very hot. That's why a lot of the gents are in their, in their undershirts. And um, it was a lovely time. But th this this ties into what we said before our, our guiding principles we, we're host and hostess of the barony and we wish to make everybody feel welcome this is from the set of photos that we sometimes refer to as the murder baron photos because that black background um around mzo's face some of those photos these were mostly taken i believe by morgan donner who's a fabulous photographer um, with black, there was dark uh, black or dark green curtains behind us really made the, the shot stand out. That's a Madrona Arts and Sciences uh, event. Charles looks a little scary in this photograph. Yeah, he's pretty, he's, he's doing a pretty intense uh, murder baron in this particular shot. <laughs> I, I, I believe we were watching a troupe of Middle Eastern dancers in, in this shot. And that is uh, Master Guillaume uh, behind him, yeah. He looks like he's maybe almost smiling. Yeah, well, he's, watch he's watching an arts performance. We're, we, we all look a little focused there. <laughs> so this, this go is ahead, our Bob. first uh, Lionheart's demo in a park in Bellevue. Uh, th this is us honoring Rotrude, who I I like to run run all our tournaments by accol accolade because it's more important to me who's the honorable, who's the funnest fight, and Rotrude presented me and and i regret my decision at, at this time but she presented me a bit of a conundrum because she was far and away the winner of the accolades however she did not win a single fight <laughs> and we decided we if she would have won one fight we could have declared her champion which i now regret we should have just given her the champion anyway however this is us expounding how wonderful a person she is and telling her how she is the best fighter out there because everybody enjoyed fighting her. She is an amazing, um, the, her enthusiasm and her joy on the field is really unparalleled. And I think that one of our goals is definitely to elevate the joy in doing above the award at the end. Uh, this was at uh, Baroness's War in um, uh, Volkenfeld, uh, their, their event. And uh, we had just arrived to day trip and we were trying to get things set up and someone comes up to me and says, Your Excellency, would you like to be one of the Baronesses who gets to ride a horse into court? Yes, <laughs> yes, please. And I felt so lovely. Uh, that was a new bicocket, so the, the coronet is, is balanced on it a little, a little bit precariously. It wasn't really made to work with coronet especially well. And that's uh, Gigi being led by uh, Mistress Thierrier. It is uh, her horse. And Mistress Anissa and Master Guillaume are walking with us and His Excellency on the other side. But uh, being able to be escorted on horseback into a court was one of the most beautiful moments of being a Baroness. You look very happy to be up there. I'm pretty good at looking calm and regal on top of a horse. Briefly. <laughs> 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 uh, that was from the last Grand Prix before COVID, uh, the beautifully cold Grand Prix in Cleallum. But we were very warm and merry, uh, and uh, Her Majesty um, Livia and uh, um, Morgan, uh, His Majesty, were the, the crowns and attended that event. And Livia made the, um, the pas de arms the most fun we'd ever done. Uh, it's possible that uh, Raphael the Rogue uh, bringing as his judge's bribe uh, hot toddy ingredients for everyone and the fire pit, the, there was a gas fire pit in the Bronio Pavilion to keep us all warm. Those might have helped with our merriness, <laughs> but I think this is a wonderful picture of me and 
Um, that's uh, uh, Her Excellency of Wywood, Aline, who I'm good friends with now, uh, next to me, our, our neighboring Baroness. And um, uh, Mistress Disa is the photographer in the foreground, who is now the Baroness of Glenmere. And uh, Heloisa, our, our dear friend, is now lives outside of Madrona, outside of Antir. But I, I like the big smiles uh, and the lots of cozy hoods. <laughs> I like this shot because it shows how amazingly the, the rainbow silk scarf flows in the wind at West War. Uh, I think that's Kalja in, in the foreground in front yep. of me. And I'm holding the boxes of pewter. When I go to West War, one of my favorite things to do is to go walk around because I don't, I don't know a lot of people down there. Uh, we've, only, we've gone now about five years, but I, I was new at one point. And I just took my box of pewter and Tomekin's box of pewter. I'd, I'd asked her to let me bring that. And so I walk up to a camp and from outside I say, shiny, shiny pewter at low, low prices, pins, pendants, pornography. And then they invite you into camp. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to show your wares and they offer you water or whatever. And often I've gotten to meet other artisans and see their art and, um, and sell them pewter. And lots of pewter pornography does get sold that way. Sometimes bells and buttons too. Nice. What's the story behind the rainbow scarf? Is that something that was hand dyed for you or, or that you? No, actually my mom, uh, my mom is a great garage sailor. Uh, uh, she says so the usual source uh, or the secondary market. And um, she actually picked up that scarf intending to give it to my niece, uh, my sister's daughter. And I said, no, I need that. And I love wearing it. It's, it's very long. And so it's easy to attach to the back of my uh, coronet. And, uh, and let it flow around me. And I do wish to represent, I, I do wear rainbows to some extent in pride uh, representation. I do uh, consider myself queer, I identify as bisexual, but I also really want to represent pride as a way for people to be and to be uh, representing that it is welcome uh, for people to identify anywhere on the rainbow in Madrona and in Ontario. And so I often, I actually, uh, thought I had it in the bag with me and didn't have the laurel that I have rainbow silk thread around. So one of my laurels that I most often wear is a rainbow laurel, but I do wear the rainbow scarf often, sort of for both reasons. I love it. This is a, a large man with a small cat. <laughs> Dude, that is young Moira. <laughs> Moira belongs to Basilius and Mesia. And uh, I think that was last Halloween our neighborhood planned a uh, Halloween parade for uh, the children to participate in and they each received a bucket of candy at the end rather than uh, going house to house during COVID. And we invited uh, Alaric and Aline of Wywood to join us and we sat in our front yard in our garb and coronets and waved at the parade as it went by. Basilius and, um, and Misia and uh, Tabby came by and visited and brought the, their young, young kitten Moira that we got to to play with the kitten but that's why we're in garb with masks on because that was last october before vaccines i think this might be the last picture i yeah it is so yeah. i will stop sharing there we go cool. wonderful do we have more questions well i i kind of wonder 12th night 12th night so um we uh we're still having an in-person Twelfth Night. <laughs> um, last year, uh, Twelfth Night did uh, rotate and become a, a virtual event. Uh, the hotel was able to basically uh, allow our contract to be renegotiated for the following year. Um, and so we are on for 2022. Things have gotten challenging uh, as COVID has continued. Um, at this stage, it appears that the hotel won't close again. And because the kingdom's already signed a contract for 2023, the most likely scenario is that even if things have to be scaled back, there will still be an in-person 12th night. Uh, it may be smaller. The, I think, very good news that we got last week, in addition to a crown tournament being scheduled, meaning that we didn't have to try to include a tournament at 12th night, which was a challenge that we were preparing for, but not one that we thought ideal, um, that also... King County has announced uh, that in addition to, of course, Washington statewide mask requirement, um, a vaccine requirement. 
for large indoor gatherings, including conventions that we very clearly uh, qualify as. Um, official language about that has been written, has been approved by Kingdom and Society Seneschal, um, and is waiting to be published. Uh, but right now is a lot of what's being published is about the Crown Tournament very reasonably because it is coming up very soon. Yes. We're holding back a little bit before sharing that a little bit more. Um, but yes, we are still planning on an in-person 12th night. And the good news is it's going to be a coronation, hopefully without a tournament. My fingers are crossed because nothing is guaranteed to us in these times. Um, I am incredibly grateful to my uh, co-event steward, John DePercy, has been um, steady and stalwart and um, the rest of my team, almost just about everybody who had volunteered for 12th Night 2021 agreed to volunteer for 2022. And um, even uh, the people who did uh, Ethereal 12th Night 2021, so when we pivoted to doing Ethereal, some of them were, were other folks. And um, we had hoped potentially to take some of the good from that and hope to apply it to in-person. We're not sure how that's going to work out. There's a lot we don't know. And of course, knowing who the, uh, um, the yeah. next heirs are going to be will help with that. Um, and I think that their majesties will have a better sense of what they expect to want a 12th night after the crown tournament. Um, but one thing that we did with Ethereal 12th night was had uh, themed salons that was, there's a topic, show up and you can talk to other people about it, which was really great because instead of just, okay, here's a social room, you can go hang out. It gave people a reason to talk to somebody they didn't know and a topic, but it wasn't very guided. The host didn't have to do very much and people got a lot out of it. It was really positive social interaction for folks. And so if, it, if there is a way for it to work and that's a big if, um, and if we are gathering and using as many rooms as we would at a regular 12th night, we would love to see uh, a chance to have themed songs, to have people have some chance to interact and meet in those contexts. Um, not every meeting room at the hotel has the ability to have cross ventilation and some other factors. So there's still an awful lot we don't know. I wish, I wish we could feel like we knew more, but at this stage, we're, it seems reasonably certain that 12th night 2022 will still happen. It's at the SeaTac Doubletree. Uh, it's directly across from SeaTac Airport. It's really easy to fly to if you're coming from far away, or um, it's actually easier to fly out of Canada than drive. <laughs> um, but I'm not exaggerating. We are literally across the street from the airport. And uh, it's also the largest hotel that Ontario uses for 12th night. And uh, we double dog dare y'all to um, fill the hotel if you can. You cannot book us full. And if, if you do, and we really love, would love to see that, but um, they will expand our room block into their neighboring Hilton Garden Inn. So this is absolutely the 12th night that everybody who's vaccinated can attend. Excellent. That's exciting on so many levels. Um, and I want to extend a, a, a thank you and so much appreciation for all of the effort that you and your team went through to plan a 12th night that got canceled and then to pivot and make it virtual and then to come back <laughs> and plan another in-person 12th night. It's pretty heroic. Thank you. I probably won't volunteer to uh, event steward anything big for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've earned that. <laughs> and NDO for being supportive and, and uh, keeping her head on straight. I'm sure that's been a lot of work as well. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a fair amount of listening to meetings from the other room or trying to escape <laughs> the <Zoom> meetings. <laughs> do, you, do you guys have any like plans for when you step down or things that you want to do? I've been trying to uh, envision <laughs> what uh, what post baronial life will look for, like for us. Um, you know, it's really hard to envision the future uh, at, at this time. Um, I hope that I'll feel like making stuff. Uh, I look forward to wearing my heart shaped veil and uh, and my boy clothes more often. Um, not that anybody prevented me from doing so. I've just largely felt like it's nice to it's nice to be the match set. <laughs> yeah. I have a selection of hats that I'm looking forward to wear again. Okay. 
just the little things. <laughs> just little things. Um, we we are uh, we are in queue to have coronets made, but uh, it's never a guarantee that one is going to become a, a crown or a court baron after our, the tenure. So um, we are working on dreaming up plans in that direction. Excellent. Uh, it, 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 I am of the opinion <laughs> that everybody that has served as Baron and Baroness during this uh, pandemic um, deserves all of the things. <laughs> Agreed. Um, it's been quite, quite a task uh, keeping the communities uh, nurtured and going. And um, I really appreciate all that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ditto. And I, I really appreciate um, how transparent and how great your communication has been with your barony, um, just as a resident. So, thank you. Thank yeah, you. It, it can it can feel a lot like we're not doing anything sometimes. I really appreciate tremendously how great our barony has been. Um, our barony, a lot of the people who attend Curia are very cautious, <laughs> and that caution has played out in the end, very reasonably for Madrona. We haven't had to cancel a lot of events because we didn't, after COVID started, we didn't keep scheduling. We had to cancel everything. That All that glorious calendar for 2020 had to be canceled. But um, at this stage, we have uh, an event getting put together for February of 2022, uh, another tavern night, which is the last event that Madrona held before uh, COVID. And um, fingers crossed that that will be able to happen. Um, it's a nice small, it was really, it was really actually a really fun little tiny event. And uh, we're looking forward to, to seeing that happen again. But I'm really grateful that the Barony uh, has taken care of one another and um, looked out for each other and not demanded things that couldn't happen. Science is, is real. <laughs> yeah. Science is real. <laughs> I know, shocking. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we haven't hit on? I don't think so. I mean, is there any, anything that you wanted to talk to talk about, Love, that the that you have not yet? Yeah, I I um thank you. I, it was an honor to be invited uh to, to speak with you guys and um we've never given interviews of course as Baron and Baroness before um and thanks for giving me the opportunity to to pump Twelfth Night since that's my my, my project du jour um and uh I definitely hope that we'll see everyone at an Athenaeum in the future as well yeah, uh, and all our other events too on, on definitely a legacy event. that we want to see Madrona and we'd lo love to see if everybody come out and fight, fight to be our champions who wish to I, I um you letting us know that that twelfth night isn't like this this ten, tentative like tenuous thing um, makes me very happy. <laughs> Yay! It it is as real as we can make it. Yeah. Uh, it it's been it's a, it's there's been a lot of well maybe next month we'll know what things are like you know as we have a meeting every month um, but it's feeling a lot more real now obviously uh, a crown tournament being scheduled definitely makes it feel a lot more real and. As the crown has shared, and, and we we did know this, we had heard this before the crown had shared it, the bot is really clear that the crown of Ontario must change over in January. And that's another thing we're like, okay, that means the 12th night's happening. You know, that the, one way or another, we need to have that, um, that ceremonial event. Um, it, I don't know yet how it might uh, be available online for people who cannot attend it. Um, and we are keeping an eye on that to some extent, looking at how uh, the Crown Tournament and Summits will handle that, will inform what we can do online. Um, there are issues of permissions and things um, for, for sharing court live and so forth. But I know that we will need to have there be a way for people who, for their health and safety, cannot attend Twelfth Night to feel included as well. Um, but I'm very hopeful that the many vaccinated, healthy Ontarians will be able to gather and, and represent at least a slice of what 12th night used to be. Well, uh, there are definitely uh, plans uh, afoot to do some virtual uh, things for Crown. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I saw that. And so think about what you might want to do with 12th night if you want to do 
that too would be uh, twelve nine is also the fortieth anniversary of on Ontario becoming a kingdom. Oh wow! Wow! Uh, <laughs> so we we do hope to honor that a little bit if we can. That's super exciting. It's exciting. I didn't know that. Well, thank you so much for your time this evening and, and you. for sharing yourselves with us. Um, the privilege to be able to talk to you. Yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about um, what we're doing tomorrow? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why don't you talk about it? I totally well, forgot. Tomorrow, we are teaming up with the Lion's Den and we're going to have Master Eduardo on um, Lion of Frontier um, to talk about the border and um, the requirements and, and how it's been. And he's crossed a couple of times since it's opened um, to land traffic to Canada. So um, it can alleviate some people's concerns about, you know, going to Crown. So I'm looking forward to talking to him about that because, you know, that I think that's weighing on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Um, and then next week, we're having the Baron and Baroness of Lionsgate. So fantastic. Yeah. So we'll probably talk about Crown a little bit too. <laughs> yep. Thank you. For sure. Yeah. Well, right. um, uh, we we wish uh, all of the Crown combatants, but especially the ones that we know and love from our region, uh, great success at Crown as well. Indeed. Well, thank you everyone for joining us, and uh, we will see you next week. See you next week. Or tomorrow. Or yeah, or tomorrow. <laughs>